day 627 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently Russia sits on more than 311,000 military personnel losses there, uh, which represents an additional one, uh, 1,100 in the past 24 hours. And just to make a mention of the, the previous day, it was uh, at a similar amount of 1130. Then as for hardware losses in the last day, 7 tanks, 32 APVs and a whopping 32 artillery with similar numbers for yesterday except uh, a lot more tanks numbering 25. And we'll get into the why uh, for all of these high numbers shortly on the map. But firstly, we'll move to the, uh, the map and start out in Russia, specifically in Razan, where 19 freight wagons derailed and was suspected to be as a result of saboteur partisan activities due to an explosion uh, at the scene. Then moving across to the right next door oblast of Tambov, because in the day just prior, a fire also broke out at a gunpowder plant in the oblast. And do note, the factory is located about 450 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. The only question is, how did this happen? And it's not even the first time a, a Russian gunpowder factory has gone off with a, a big kaboom in this year alone. So there's likely to be three obvious causes to an event like this. Either A, a 450 kilometer long range Ukrainian drone hit it, or B, more local partisan saboteur activity, or C, poor maintenance upkeep or terrible safety standards. Oh, and I would be remiss not to mention that uh, that of a fourth option, <laughs> which could be or have been Sergei the Smoker or Cigarette Conscriptovich. Then we'll head into Ukraine today and we'll take a look at the, the reason for all of those Russian hardware losses over the, the, the last weekend, or in the last couple of days, better to say. So we move to Avdivka as Russia continues a new wave of offensive operations in the region on both the northern and the southern flanks, sending in lots of armoured vehicle rounds in an attempt to reach the, the smaller settlement of uh, Steptova. Now this is as per the northern flank here, as Russian forces initially made it to the outskirts uh, of the town, but were pushed back again uh, to the uh, pretty much to the train line and took massive losses in the process. As Russian forces in the area just keep driving straight into Ukrainian ATGM fire zones or anti tank guided missile fire zones. In fact, right now, anti tank weapons are playing a very prominent role in this northern flank engagement, similar to the, uh, the early stages of this war back in February, March 2022. Sort of an act first and think later approach from the Russian army. Oh, and also, the US supplied Bradley M2s were said to be working incredibly well right here as a form of frontline fire support uh, at the, the railway line also. Then moving to the southern flank as even more recently, Russia continued to push lightly armored mechanized formations uh, across open ground southwest of Avdivka. And the results are unsurprising. Seen here, the Ukrainian 53rd Mechanized Brigade dismantles a Russian assault uh, with ATGM and indirect fire. So right here we have six burnt out IFVs, infantry fighting vehicles, and one that is well, now a crater. So it looks like Russia is once again going for the, the Pyrrhic victory tactics. Now it's acceptable to say that uh, Russia does in fact have sufficient manpower reserves in this region, uh, just to the east of Abdivka right now. But the larger question may appear to be, can they support those reserves with sufficient levels of heavy armor and artillery support? 
But one thing is for certain, Russia cannot employ these meat wave tactics indefinitely to, say, capture Ukraine. For instance, in this latest wave over the past day or two, Russia has lost about a thousand men, and equal or double to that in wounded. Not to mention the even more unsustainable uh, losses of equipment, which is roughly 20 tanks, 40 APVs, and 50 artillery systems in the last couple of days, just at this point on the map too. And it was all for gaining just 100 meters, this little bit here, on the, the northern flank, which may have actually since uh, been lost, with Russia receding from this point that's uh, not yet updated on the map. But we'll find out that for certain based on the, the updated situation as of tomorrow. But even having said that, the original Lord of the Rings meme said it best, saying, one does not simply walk into Mordor. Significant intel and preparation is required. Then we'll head across to the other side of the map today, uh, to the, well, the left bank uh, development is, is really ongoing here, so Kherson we're talking about. And that is to say the actions of the armed forces of Ukraine on the south bank are ongoing. For instance, there are reports of Ukrainian forces forming another bridgehead north of Holopristan. Which makes sense and is of particular significance as this will stretch Russian forces, being that most river crossings by the AFU have been done 20 to 30 kilometers to the, uh, to the east of this location. And add to that, with all of these sustained river crossing operations over the Dnipro by the AFU, they're becoming very well practiced and quite adept at doing this as they perform artillery fire for cover uh, from the northern bank uh, and make these well-timed and efficient positional amphibious moves to the south. And I don't think either side has any doubt at this point that Ukraine will continue to do this and expand their positions eventually all along the south, taking advantage of Russia's much more limited presence in the region. Then we'll head across to Crimea as we've got some just as compelling news from the weekend where Ukraine released some footage of naval drones, uh, their AFU naval drones attacking and reportedly sinking two small Russian landing craft, which were moored in their Chernomorska uh, ports. And I've got to say, events like these certainly underscore the importance of how a country with a practically non-existent navy can use small but agile and effective naval drones to beat a superior naval power or opponent. In fact, it makes me think of uh, China and Taiwan relations, as China would certainly consider this a concerning development as Taiwan could easily copy that technology and those tactics against some potentially upcoming naval military threats uh, by China. In fact, given Taiwan's global technology dominance and man manufacturing prowess, I'd be surprised if Taiwan didn't already operate a small fledgling fleet that's something similar to these naval drone bad boys in operation by the AFU. Then we'll move across to some news for today. So uh, let's see, starting out again with some hardware news. So of sorts, uh, this is more in the support side of things. So Germany is uh, going to double its military aid uh, to Ukraine for the coming year. So this is 2024. So instead of 4 billion uh, euros, it's going to be, Germany's, Germany's going to send 8.6 billion euros for the year. And just in terms of European support, I also foresee the EU bypassing Hungarian veto power at some point to uh, provide Ukraine with 50 billion euros. And if they can't get past uh, Ukraine, uh, Hungarian blockages, well, they'll just make their own EU consortium of supportive EU nations to, to keep the flow of aid to Ukraine happening. After all... Ukraine is really right, literally right on their NATO doorstep. And it was French World War I uh, PM Prime Minister George Clemenceau that said, War is won by enduring just a quarter of an hour longer than the enemy. Then moving on in uh, something of a hardware segment as well. So due to the mud season in Ukraine, 
Some Ukrainian soldiers in frontline trench positions uh, report how they can go through a, a pair of army boots in less than a few days, something like uh, 48 to 72 hours. Now, thankfully for them, equipment drops uh, come at night, giving them fresh footwear, clothes, and all manner of products that deal with uh, this type of wear and tear. It's little things like these that can always make uh, a big difference. And I cannot help but think uh, how any Russian frontliners dealing with these types of severely muddy conditions do not receive any replenishment of this caliber whatsoever. In fact, autumn and winter conditions for Russian soldiers are some of the most despicable that their command could ever force upon them. Certainly, some will freeze to the point of no longer being with the living. Then moving across to a, another Russian military mobilization blunder segment of sorts. Okay, and so here we have a video of a patient in a Russian military hospital. He shows the, the cramming in of beds, the, the single wash basin outside, the single shower outside, and of course the toilets outside too. Russians live in the same level of misery they enjoyed for the last hundred years. And remember, this is not some barracks, this is military field hospitals. Meanwhile, a NATO field hospital looks something a little more like this, which is actually kitted out with the health-centered medical equipment and people they need. It's just a no-brainer which one you would choose to opt for. Then to a quick funny to round it all off for today, guys. So a bit of an odd one, but um, Russian riot police officers stormed a peaceful concert at the Cosmonaut Club in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, a few days ago because the band Zero People advocated for peace. Interestingly, it was actually a premeditated intervention of the riot police just mere minutes before the concert was about to begin. So we're looking at almost Gestapo-like tactics of fear and intimidation towards anyone that doesn't support the official political narrative within Russia. There is no free speech in Russia. Which is funny, because in Russia, you can't call it a war. Uh, you can't make peace calls either, so... Feels like kind of being stuck between a rock and a hard place. And even more interesting uh, was the reason as to why the riot police actually disrupted the concert in the first place, which is really quite a grey area, as the lead singer made a post online just a couple of days before the event stating that he was a patriotic Russian that neither supported Ukraine, okay, so he's saying that he doesn't support Ukraine, uh, nor opposed Russia's military actions in Ukraine. That's it. So he doesn't support Ukraine, he says, and he said specifically that he doesn't oppose military actions in Ukraine. So apparently, if you're Russian, uh, this means you have to fully back the government's narrative. No matter how twisted, confusing, and nonsensical it is. What a joke. So thanks for watching today, guys. Uh, that will be it. But um, yeah, I really appreciate you watching. Please continue to like and subscribe if not already. If you generally watch the channel um, and you and you, you haven't yet subscribed, really appreciate it up to the point of 100k subscribers. Just want to reach that little milestone there. Then I'll never ask anyone to subscribe again. Not until some ridiculously high milestone, of course. So thanks again, guys. And I do hope to see... All of you there in the next one. Cheers.